Imagine a world where fantasy sports lives forever. No season to season stuff, no hiatus, no breaks, no deleting the app because you lost in the finals by 0.5 points because of a kicker. In this episode, we got you. My special guest is going to give you the ins and outs of Dynasty Fantasy Basketball. We believe every NBA fan that plays fantasy football should also play fantasy basketball. I am so excited about having Noah Rubin on the show. He's going to break down Dynasty for us. He has worked for Roto World for the past two years now, and he's the host of the Tank Me Later podcast with a focus on Dynasty fantasy basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Rubin. Robin, thank you so much for having me back, man. Excited to be back here for the second time. Plan on being back more if you'll have me. Uh, and you chose a great topic, man. I spent entirely way too much time uh, reading about, talking about, and just wasting time setting lineups, sending bad trades, uh, focusing on Dynasty. So I'm really excited to be able to talk about it. Dynasty life. People look at us, Dynasty players, is like, Listen, you guys are committed. (laughs) If you could do this year round, you are committed. Uh, So I'm happy to be able to have this discussion. And I think so often, Noah, when I see content around Dynasty, it picks up from a place where people already know what it is, right? So I get a lot of comments from people who are like, what are you talking about? So just to start off, could you give us like a quick and dirty breakdown of what is Dynasty Fantasy Basketball? Yeah, man, absolutely. It's a... You know, everybody just sticks to redraft for the most part. Everybody does that. Um, it's kind of the the gateway into playing in the more dynasty leagues. I think if you just hear somebody say, oh, I play this fantasy sport, they don't even know what the word redraft means because that's just kind of, they don't hear that. They just say, okay, I'm just going to play this league. That's the only option, right? But dynasty leagues are where you're keeping your team and you're trying to run it as close to a actual franchise as possible, whether it's fantasy football, baseball, basketball, you're trying to run your organization as better than probably uh, your favorite team does. So you're starting up with a draft and then you're just going to keep these players until you trade them or they retire. It's uh, you can get as complex as you want with it. You can add in salaries and contracts and whatever, but the basic form of dynasty is you're drafting players and you're keeping them until you move on from them. And then during the summers, the off seasons, uh, you're drafting in new rookies and young guys end up having a lot more value in dynasty leagues than they do in redraft. Yup. And I find too, that for a dynasty player, it's really cool because it's almost like year round action, right? So it's like, you're paying more attention to what's happening with, you know, the new prospects coming in. Some some leagues even allow you to like do trades and stuff, you know, in the off season. So talk to fantasy managers about getting into dynasty fantasy basketball and what makes the experience different than doing like a redraft league, daily fantasy and other formats. Yeah, honestly, it's it's more fun for me because it's it's long term investments, right? You're you're buying in on the players that you like, the ones that, you know, it's like, okay, no, I know that I'm right about this guy. I don't care what anybody else says. He's going to be a star and you're investing in that player and keeping them around until they reach that, you know, elite value. If you look at a guy like Lowry Markkinen, you know, what was last year for him year seven or eight, maybe somebody coming out said, man, Lowry Markkinen is going to be a star. He's my favorite player. I'm not giving up on him, drafting him. And probably pretty disappointing for the first six or so years. And then, boom, all of a sudden, top 25 player. And it's like, it's that that gratification, that reward of investing in a young guy and having them actually pan out. Now, obviously, it's not the same investment that an NBA team is putting into a guy because you can't actually put them through more intense workouts and invest in them uh, the way that an NBA team can. But you can keep them around and just truly believe in them, which is a ton of fun. Um, and, you know, it's something... Uh, like you said, it's a year round demand. It's, it does, it's very demanding in comparison to a redraft league where you have your team for three months, or I guess the NBA season is longer than three months. What am I saying? But five or six months, and then you're uh, probably not worried about it again until the next year. And you're catching up on all the fantasy analysts to see, okay, who should I draft in my draft? And then uh cycle starts over. But with dynasty, you keep these guys, you keep them forever. Um, and you, you pay attention all year round 
during the summer, like you said, trades during the summer are very fun. You know, a, like a, a random news update. There's once a week during the summer at times. It feels like that's the only time, especially in like late July and August and saying, Oh, this player is, I don't know, gain 15 pounds of muscle. And you're like, Oh man, like he's about to pop off. Like, let me go trade for him now before everybody else figures this out. So it's very demanding, but you just naturally want to become more committed and more invested in the NBA, which I'm already doing this anyway. Like even before I was working at fantasy basketball, I was keeping up with the NBA like a sicko. So now it's okay. I'm going to be in taking all this uh, time that, like I said, I waste on the NBA and actually turning it into something useful. So it's uh, you definitely have to be kind of a try hard with uh, dynasty leagues to be successful, but man, there's nothing quite like it. Mm, mm, tell me about it. So I, I always share this story. I had a, a my home league, right? Me and my guys. It's a small league. It's an eight man league, so everyone's got a stack roster, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, one of my my boys drafted Luka Doncic his rookie year, right? And you know, Luka wasn't like averaging twenty five. He was averaging like 17, 18 points a game. Pretty modest, but good. Him and Trey were like both mm-hmm. looking like they were going to be really, really good fantasy options for the future. I saw Luka play Noah with the eye test. And when I, when I tell you he looked like that kid in the AAU tournament who's, like, dribbling circles around kids, just his change of speed, change of pace, change of speed, I was like, he's going to be awesome. So I sent him, like, I want to say DeMar DeRozan, who at the time was crushing Lucas yeah. numbers, right? And I threw him another piece, too, like a two-for-one. I was like, I just got to have the kid. Like, he was like, Really? He sent it over, and to this day, it haunts him. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, I believe it. That's uh, it's it's fun for me to look back. I've I've messaged a few different people that have kind of that data, saying like, "Hey, like, can you send me like earlier drafts?" Because I started playing uh, twenty nineteen. So Zion and Ja were rookies. Was the first time I did a dynasty startup. So I haven't been doing it for a super long time. Um, but I just I like looking back at drafts and trades like that because that's man, that's crazy. I'll. As we get into some of this, I'll, I'll share some uh, some of the trades that I've definitely really messed up on. Um, one in particular that, my goodness, was bad. But uh, things like that where you're trying to change your team direction and or you're drafting uh, during your startup and guys go so late that when you look back even a year later or sometimes five years later and you're like, man, how did that trade go through? Or how did you get that person in the 11th round? Like, that's ridiculous. They're going second round today. So we'll get into some examples of that. But that's that's an awesome story. I love that. Yep. So let's talk about the guy who says that, all right, you convinced me. I'm going to get into a dynasty league or I'm going to ask my commissioner to make us a, a bigger keeper league. Um, talk to me about long-term player value and how, and how crucial that is. And how do you assess and project the player's future potential? And what factors do you consider? Yeah, I mean, if it was an exact science, then I think we'd have a, a lot more teams with being successful in the draft. But there's definitely a lot of factors uh, that you can look at and try and use, whether it be advanced stats or just going kind of off your own personal eye test. I think that's what separates uh, dynasty winners from dynasty losers at times. Uh, if you kind of go off of your own personal biases. Everybody can look at different dynasty analysts and there's a number of them that do incredible work and see, okay, if I just use these rankings, like these, this is how our league should shake out. But if you kind of veer off the path and go with what you believe in, then that ends up helping you or hurting you just kind of depends on uh, how good you are at what you do. And I think that's what makes a a dynasty player great is how um, when they're able to project players on their own, And, you know, looking at advanced stats uh, uh, is a good one because your numbers in like small sample sizes when players are young. So if you look at not necessarily per 36 minutes, but a lot of the ones I look at like assist percentage, steal percentage, block percentage, that's how like the percentage of possessions that they're on the floor that they come away with a certain stat, whether it be assist, steals, blocks. Those are probably uh, some of the big ones. Some of the other ones get a little wonky when you look at the actual, uh, I guess details behind it, but um, like I know, for example, Walker Kessler had an absolutely insane block percentage in college and then came into the NBA and had an absolutely insane block percentage as a rookie. And 
Oh gosh, I think he went. I'm trying to remember my my own uh, home league rookie draft. He went pretty late, like kind of later second round, maybe mid second round. And he's a guy that's now probably top five from that class. I'd say like very easily top five. So looking at some advanced numbers like that, situation's important, but it's not forever. I mean, players situations change every few months. I mean, whether it be a trade, a free agent signing, an injury, uh, or just earning a role. I think there's a lot of, you're kind of considering everything in dynasty, which is the beauty of it. Because if, if you're looking at like the thunder, okay, like they're ready to win now. Whereas two years ago, they were still in their rebuilding phase. So they were more likely to give young guys minutes and you can expand on that opportunity. Whereas now they're looking more to win now. So there may not be as many minutes for a rookie like Casey Wallace, or if Usman Ding, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, if he isn't playing well to start the season, he may be left on the bench in order for them to focus on winning now, because that's kind of where their team direction is at. Uh, player age is important because if a guy is on a team that's looking to win now and they're 19, they may have to sit the bench for a few years. You're wearing your Hawk stuff. I'm wearing my Hawk stuff. And you can look at coaches. Nate McMillan was not going to play rookies. They had Jalen Johnson playing in the G league, his entire rookie season. AJ Griffin was able to play a little bit more than that during his rookie season, but like you have to really, it's in depth. You can look at everything as a, an individual factor. Um, a guy like Tom Thibodeau is a, a fun coach to look at as well because you know he's going to play probably six guys, 36 minutes per game, which got really frustrating with Obi Toppin, but now he has a better opportunity. That's an example of opportunities changing for players really quickly. So all that long summary to say you have to look at literally everything. <laughs> What do you look at? Uh, everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's that's some it. examples, but man, it's everything. I get it, man. Well, um, I have uh, a couple of guys in in one of my leagues. Well, actually, th- two or three of them who are like, who have been rebuilding since we started, right? <laughs> so talk to me about uh, establishing a balance between stars and young talents, like rebuilding and actually playing for the championship now. And, you know, just about getting success and long-term gro- growth with that balance between young and old. Yeah. I think the, uh, the strategy that I take kind of depends on who I'm playing with. So when I'm playing with my home league and I know everybody there is okay, like they're in it for the long haul, like they're not going to disband the league after a year or two, like, we're going to be doing this for a long time. I went through a very, very slow rebuild process. Now I have a very, very good team and still have future draft capital. Um, So that's okay. But generally speaking, um, you're going to try and do both during your startup draft. You're probably not going to immediately commit, or it's probably not the smartest strategy to, uh, to immediately commit to either rebuilding or just going all in on winning now, because, if you're just going all in on winning now, you have an older team. Uh, sure, you'll be very competitive for a few seasons, but just like that, a few injuries and players retiring, and you have to start over from square one. And if you've traded away all your draft picks, then you have to go through a very slow rebuild that's not as much fun because you don't have these young players to watch. But if you go and try and rebuild immediately, then you know what happens if uh, you started this dynasty league with random people or people that you've met um, through different fantasy resources. And then some players quit and all of a sudden this league gets disbanded and you were so excited because you had 12 firsts over the next two seasons. Like your team was going to be stacked, but now it means nothing. So you're going to want to go in and try and keep it balanced. So what I think the best strategy to do is honestly zig when others zag. So if other people are going with young players early, then you may want to go a little bit more with uh, some more win now guys earlier on. And then later in the draft, take some upside swings on younger guys. However, if in your startup draft, people are trying to just win now early on, then maybe it's best to go younger early and later on get some of those not very fun, older, but still serviceable guys. Um, Like a guy like an Al Horford goes very late, like outside the top, like first 250 picks in a dynasty startup. And he can provide some solid value, keep you a little bit competitive um, while you're also having rookies. Like Harrison Barnes goes incredibly late. He's not a fun guy. You don't really want him in a redraft league, but he can be serviceable while your young guys are developing. So you you need to kind of zig when others zag, but 
Uh, I think ideally you're going to want to go younger early, try and secure your future stars, the guys that are going to be really good for the next 10 to 15 years. And then later in the draft, probably get a few more role players per se, like guys that can provide some value early, uh, but may not last as long. And then by the end of the draft, man, take those upside swings, take that guy that went, late in the second round of the draft last year. And you have no idea if he's ever going to play an NBA game, but you like him for some reason. I do that. I do that a lot. I end up taking guys that are probably not going to ever do anything, but I like them for some reason. So it's a uh, zigging when others zag is probably the best way to sum that up. I like that. And one thing that I like to do is stash injured players, especially mm-hmm. in dynasty. Right? So I'm like, I'm like the cleanup man, like the scraps off the table that people are like, nah, like whatever. Uh, I'm I'm that guy, right? And also, I'm I'm infamous for like making uh, bold offers for injured, uh, for young injured players. For example, Chet Holmgren, I sent like a pretty. I don't remember what I traded him, how I got him, but I got him like at the beginning of last year. Let him sit there, no one cared, no one thought about him, and now he's going to be playing this year. So my question is. How do you handle injuries and roster adjustments in dynasty leagues, considering the long-term nature of the format? Yeah, I think uh, how the teams are approaching the injuries as well are, is very important. Um, I think probably the biggest example of that right now is a guy like Lonzo Ball, who it it seems like, man, when is the last time he played? It's, it's coming up um, almost two years since the last time he played. He's going to be out all of this season. So it's like, how much value does he have? Like when he plays the top 50 player, but he hasn't played in two years. So a guy like that is a great buy low. I mean, worst case scenario, the manager in your, in your league that has him might say, Hmm, he might never play basketball again. Like that's a very real possibility. Why not set a late round pick for him? If, it, if not, you just gave up probably a, a, a future G league all-star. That's probably they potentially may never play in the NBA aside from on a two way, a couple games, and you're getting a, a guy that may not play, but still has a ton of upside. Chet Holmgren's a great example. I think if you're playing in leagues with uh, that are really competitive, then I think everybody's kind of was under the the same understanding that Chet was going to be a star the moment he played. But I know people in my home league that were saying, "Yeah, no, Chet, his body's just not built for the NBA. Like he's never going to have any success." Unfortunately, the guy that has him didn't trade him to me, but I tried. Um, yeah, I mean, you're you're looking for those opportunities to buy low, but a lot of the times when you're playing in dynasty leagues, these are the sickos, these are the really competitive people that pay attention to everything every day, and they're also seeing the same information saying, oh, okay, yeah, no, this player, if they play or when they play, they're going to be incredible, and they're keeping up with the news updates as well, so you're not going to see a random Lonzo Ball news update that says, no, he actually might play at the end of this season, and be able to, okay, cool, like, let me go ahead and get this trade offer in real quick because the season after that, he should be back in full strength because the managers in your dynasty league are probably keeping up with that as well. I think it's more likely to take advantage of that in your home league uh, than if you're playing in a, a competitive high money league um, with other dynasty addicts. But there's a, there's opportunity that can be had when, when managers stop believing in their players. Yep. So when we talk about finding those rookies and finding those young players, what tools or systems, what, how would you recommend for new dynasty managers to approach scouting, drafting uh, young players, and developing that young talent for, for the future? Yeah, there's a lot of resources you can use. Uh, I know I've talked with some dynasty analysts, and I think we're actually starting – our draft tonight, we're doing a college basketball fantasy league. So we've all said we're not putting any money down. This is just for us to do some scouting, uh, just to get an idea of what these players look like. So I think that's something that I've done with fantasy football as well, uh, that one of my friends suggested, like, hey, look, let's just do this just so we can kind of start taking a look at prospects because rookies do play such a significant role and get it in drafting well is how you succeed for a long time in Dynasty. Like your, your startup draft's important, but – making trades after that and participating in your rookie draft and killing that is really how you have success in dynasty formats. Uh, the start of draft, I mean, your entire roster is going to be different within two years. If it's a really uh, competitive league or an actively, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but um, also looking at 
just draft sites. Like there's a lot of guys that just focus on uh, scouting, not for fantasy, that I think are, it's a very important resource. Um, no Ceilings is a really good Twitter account that I follow. I know there's others I follow that do great work as well, but we were talking about them earlier in that in a, with some of the dynasty analysts saying that they do really good work. They've already started working on the 2024 draft, like probably the, the day after the 2023 draft um, and focusing on some of those prospects. So getting an understanding of what these prospects look like, how they can impact NBA teams, because another thing is, okay, you look at their numbers in college and this player averaged, 28 points per game you're like there's no way that he's bad in the nba but he's 24 years old doing that against 19 year olds well okay maybe his role isn't going to be as big or you know he's putting up numbers but everybody's just saying he's just not very good like you just can't believe that this guy that averaged 25 a game is going or projected to go in the second round and you know their numbers are great when they were on the court but they're probably not just going to be able to make it on the court in the NBA. So having an understanding of who's actually good at basketball and not just good for fantasy basketball, because that's how they get on the court. And it, as good as they'd be for fantasy, you look at a guy like uh, Alexei, po- Alexei Pokusevsky, goodness gracious, uh, Poku, we'll go with Poku from the Thunder, fantasy superstar when he's on the court. He's been kind of derailed by injuries a little bit, but you know now it's even when he's healthy, that team is too stacked. He's probably not going to be good enough to be on the floor looking at situations like that uh, where players may have good fantasy skill sets, but just aren't very good at basketball. That's something to also consider. So looking at fantasy projections, looking at just general basketball projections, like both are are vital to try and uh, scout. Well, Mm, very good. Those are some nuggets right there, man. Those are some nuggets. So sometimes in dynasty leagues, especially people who are new, right? So new managers and also new uh, new league commissioners, right? Trades go out and people are like, no, what are you doing? You can't do that. And someone on the other side of the table might be like, no, you don't understand. He's a young player. I'm banking on upside, like approve my trade. And then there's some drama might brew. So talk to me about some trade best practices in Dynasty. And talk to the league managers, I mean, the 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 the, the Dynasty league manager about that, like making those decisions to make sure that things stay fair and balanced and but also you can respect the fact that this is different than redraft definitely i think we uh last time i was on here we talked about trade vetoes as well so i'll start with that uh there's nothing more frustrating than getting your trade vetoed i think the only reason that there should be a veto is if it's obvious collusion um which you know it's frustrating and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that I don't know. It's hard to even point out what collusion is in dynasty because somebody just maybe really, really wants their guy. Like there has to be like text, text message evidence saying, Hey, I'm going to give you all my players and then I'm leaving. I'm done with this. That's collusion. But it's like in dynasty, I can give you all my good players and you give me all your draft picks and it's a fair trade because you're going to be really good. I'm going to be really bad, but in five years, I'm going to be really good. So it's hard to really pinpoint what is, a bad trade in dynasty. I think the only time other than obvious collusion that there should be a veto in a dynasty league is if say it's a 12 team league and 11, 10 or 11 of these guys have done this before. And there's just one or two new guys and everybody that's done this before is just taking all the assets from the, from the guys who have done this. They're like, what am I going to do with the first round draft pick here? Yeah. Take it. I'd rather have a 11th round producer, like whatever, bring it here. And then all of a sudden this team is stacked and has all the first from the guys who have no idea what they're doing. Okay. Then maybe we can say, Hey, like, let's not do that. Let's, let's let them figure things out a little bit before we start taking advantage of them uh, and taking all their trade assets. But if you're looking at a redraft league, some of the things you consider are, you know, positions or punt strategies. Like if somebody's punting blocks then, and they have a guy that is a good shot blocker, like, Hey, like, let me get them. I'll give you this because that'll help you a little bit more. Um, those are also things that you can consider in dynasty, but you're also looking at individual team direction. So somebody that is trying to rebuild and you're offering them LeBron for somebody and like by value, maybe LeBron has a, a lot more value than this other guy and a pick, but they're not going to be able to win for the next three years. Who knows if LeBron's going to be playing? I mean, with, with LeBron, maybe he is, but uh, by the time they're ready to compete, LeBron might be on uh, his last season. So 
just because a value looks okay, you have to consider the other team's direction as well. They may not want to trade away their first round pick this year if they are already starting off the season two and six. Like that just might not happen because they want to get uh, the rewards from that good pick. So uh, understanding what each team is trying to do, I think helps a lot. But I think this, this was going to be my bad example of the worst trade I've ever made um, is, you know, you have to understand your team direction, but you also don't want to give up too much value just because it fits your direction. So when I was doing my home league, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was like our first full year of it. And I, and my startup uh, had the fourth pick and went Jokic. This was 2019. So it was before he was fantasy superstar. He was just really like elite fantasy player. So he went fourth. He just wasn't, you know, number one. And uh, as the season went on, there was like two teams that were better. I was like, cool. I'm not going to win the championship. I'm going to just tank. It's more fun. I like tanking. Cool. I'm like texting all my friends like, Hey, like, let me, uh, I'll give you this player for a first. And I had a bunch of guys on my team that like, if I would have just held on for like two years, like I would have had the best team by far. And I traded Jokic and DeJounte Murray, who wasn't that good at the time for like three firsts in a 12 team league. And they were like late firsts. And I'm like, looking back on that, I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, I was like Jokic and like a throw in. Like, that's what it was kind of like. Like, I like, okay, DeJounte has some upside. He wants DeJounte, but I don't really know how good he's going to be. And like two years later, he's a top 10 fantasy player. And he's not like that anymore. But I'm like, looking back, I'm like, uh, if I would have just held on to at least DeJounte. Ooh. And I mean, obviously hanging on to Jokic as well. Big mistake there. But yeah, so understanding that. Mm, Maybe not everything makes sense, even if you're trying to force a, a direction there. Um, rebuild with caution, I think, is my uh, lesson to be learned from that because I love throwing away all my players, getting a bunch of picks, and just, let's start from scratch. Let's have everybody be 21 and, and younger and have 18 first for the next four seasons, and let's just have fun with this. But then Man. sometimes things like that happen. <laughs> Man. That is gut wrenching. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I look back, I'm like, I, I say I made dynasty analyst and I made this trade. Like, I don't yeah. deserve, <laughs> I don't deserve this title. This is ridiculous. You know the funny thing that I, because you know I'll share another one with you that made me think about it. Um, but one thing that I do, especially after the trade is fresh and I and I regret it, it's almost like looking at your ex girlfriend on Facebook. You're just like, <laughs> you're like scrolling. You're like, what did she do tonight? Oh, he had 25. That's not too bad. Like, good. The guy I got did 30. Then you check the next day. Oh, he did 75 fantasy points. Okay. You know, so um, this same guy. So this is part two of that same story. You know, so <laughs> this same guy who I got for Luca, I got him. And he had to live with that for a couple of years. I got really high on Evan Mobley. Like, I got so high on Evan Mobley. I was like, I'm still high on Evan Mobley, but this yeah. was like next level. I was like, okay, what can I do for Mobley? He's like, you know, I don't know, like give me some young stars. I was like, I got Giddy and I'll give you Halliburton too. <laughs> this is Halliburton was good. He was like a rookie. He was pretty good. He wasn't what he is now, Uh uh-uh. you know? And I gave him Halliburton. At the time I was like, Yes, like I got it, you know, all good. He got traded, whatever, and now he's a first round guy. Yeah. So I look back and I'm like, I got him for Luca, but he got me back. So it kind of yeah, you know, it works out like it works out sometimes where balance, but I'm the one who took the recent hit. So I, I still have to live with that. So it's all fun. You gotta get him back, man. You got. I to. know, I know. And <laughs> you know, he's 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 a he's a, a viewer, he checks out the program. So Professor, I'm on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on your ass, dog. No. Nah. Um, <laughs> so next question, and I wanna, I wanna, I want you guys, I want you to share some some targets with the audience today. So, like some people, if they're in dynasty leagues, they can they can focus on. But before we do that, I know that it's hard to keep people active in a dynasty league. So what tips do you have for league members and also league managers on keeping the environment engaged and motivated to go not just season to season, but for years and years? Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do because even with people that are really committed to it, like 
there's times where there's lapses and you're like, eh, just, you know, I need a mental break or I'm just, it's not as much fun right now, but there's definitely things you can do. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do now uh, in the league that I just started, um, I got this from NBA dynasty prospects on Twitter at ops watching. He uh, talks about jackpotting the uh, prize at the end of the year. So you pay, say it's a $10 buy-in 12 team league. Okay. Instead of the winner getting 110 or 120, they get like 20 and then you put the hundred dollars in a jackpot. And then you add that in every year in order to get from that pot, you have to win two in a row and really become a quote unquote dynasty. So if it takes 10 years, I mean, sure. You know, nobody goes back to back, you know, the stakes that 